Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Adoran First and Fifteen. Um, today, our guest is going to be uh, Dr. Pavel Sulda, which is a, a rhinology consultant of the Guys and St. Thomas University Hospital. And uh, he's also um, the president of the European Rhinologic Society Juniors. Good morning, Pavel. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you, Puya, for a uh, warm welcome and inviting me to this amazing project webinar, which I absolutely love. Now, I'm going to talk uh, this morning, lunchtime actually in my case, uh, about the novel alternative and controversial therapies of rhinitis. Uh, as uh, you were told, I'm the, I'm the rhinology consultant, so this is my field of interest. And but first of all, there will be a bit of introduction. So first of all, I would like to really emphasize how huge problem is rhinitis and how big impact is on the quality of life. So just an overview, it's a global health problem. 200 million Europeans have rhinitis, some sort of rhinitis, which is huge. And apart from that, uh, we see that about 30% of population in general struggle with uh, rhinitis. Now this affects various countries, various ethnic groups, ages, it impairs the quality of life, there are frequent com comorbidities, and especially this is a risk factor for development of asthma. Now, it's not really about occasional sneeze or some snot or post-nasal drip. It's way more than that. So if you have a look at this study by Bulo <clears throat> from 2009, uh, in terms of symptoms, you can see that more than 60% of patients who were asked about the symptoms struggle with sneezing, runny nose, itchy nose, uh, itchy red eyes, and so on. So this is for the allergic rhinitis. Um, and apart from that, there is a significant proportion who struggle with uh, asthma, cough, uh, bad sleep, sore throats, headaches, and so on. Uh, so th there's way more than just a bit of snot. Now, when you sneeze in a, not in, in a wrong moment, this can lead to uh, potentially devastating uh, consequences for your, for your future career. And I'm slightly exaggerating, but this is a beautiful study by Samantha Walker. And she was looking at the case control. Uh, she performed the case control analysis of uh, more than 1,800 uh, students and who were taking a, a GCSE, so final exams. And it showed that 38 to 43 percent of students suffered with symptoms of allergic rhinitis on the, if any of one uh, sorry on one of uh, the examination days, and this resulted that those students were four percent, uh, forty percent more likely to drop a, a grade between the practice and final. So they had a forty percent chance to uh, to have a worse performance and seventy percent more likely to drop a grade if they had a sedating antihistamines at the same time. And this was compared to the fellows without any symptoms. So this means that really it can affect uh, your performance at work, at school, and, uh, and so on. If we have a look at the rhinitis from the point of view of unified airway, which means that uh, lungs and or the asthma and, and rhinitis is the same disease, which we can see on a, on a common inflammatory mechanisms, epidemiological observations, common triggers and, and therapeutic observations, then it's way more than just a, just a rhinitis. Now we see that 80% of asthmatics have allergic rhinitis and 40% of patients with allergic rhinitis have asthma. And patients with allergic rhinitis to be approximately three times more likely to develop asthma. This was a prospective uh, longitudinal study. So there is some synergistic effect when you have allergic rhinitis and asthma, both tend to be worse, but especially the asthma. So you have got a higher chance of being hospitalized. Um, you have got a higher chance to visit the emergency department. But the main problem is that rhinitis is usually overlooked because it's a poor cousin of asthma. Um, Nobody really is interested in a, in, a, in a snotty nose when the patient has got severe asthma. So it's often overlooked, it's undertreated, and same problems or same impacts and cons consequences are also uh, in, a, in a school age 
children, so the asthmatic children with rhinitis, are more likely, almost three times, to experience frequent attacks of wheezing. Uh, 3.44 times more likely to experience severe attacks of uh, wheezing limiting speech. 10 times more to have a frequent visit uh, to their doctor because of asthma and nine times more to miss the school. And when you treat them with intranasal corticosteroids, this resulted in uh, the reduction uh, in the risk of exacerbations. So the treatment is very important and affects both. Um, this, is actually, this was actually quite novel and because now we really um, are able to, to, to understand this relationship much better than before. If I start with just very uh, simple definition, uh, chronic rhinitis is a, is a, is a disease uh, which is described by more than 12 weeks uh, lasting uh, symptoms and you should have at least two out of um, these symptoms, nasal obstruction, uh, rhinorrhea, sneezing and or itchy nose. Now, phenotypes. We have got three main phenotypes, infectious rhinitis, allergic rhinitis and non-allergic, non-infectious rhinitis. I draw attention to this paper. It's a paper by Peter Hellings, Professor Peter Hellings. Uh, it's a fractal paper which is uh, which published just recently and you can see, uh, find the all up-to-date algorithms of treatments including the, 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 the most recent uh, algorithms. Now the allergic rhinitis is usually usually presents in childhood um, and have uh, seasonal exacerbations and of course positive testing to allergies. Now the non-allergic rhinitis is usually presents in later on. Um, symptoms are perennial, there is very little seasonal variation and uh, testing for allergies is negative. So you can actually quite easily differentiate um, just based on the history. Um, um, I'm sorry, Pavel, just, just a question. Uh, I would like to stop for a second. Yeah. Would, you, would you suggest uh, those uh, questionnaire of uh, symptoms also by, uh, um, by a phone call or you just uh, would like to suggest those kind of uh, um, questionnaire by a face to face approach uh, that means uh, of uh, uh, the consequence of a meeting between the patient and the specialist now so what i do is that I give a patient every patient with a, with nasal problems uh snot 22 questionnaire um ideally you would like to give mini rqrq but snot 22 uh, but it's but we want to give one questionnaire to every patient in the waiting room for logistical reasons and then i see them so i, I heard this information beforehand and um and so therefore i give them the questionnaire without my presence so there is uh, not much of a bias and then afterwards I see the patient in the clinic and it is important to see those patients because uh, very often patient will tell you I've got a blocked nose but it's not really blocked nose he's got a sensation of a blockage in the back of the nose and then you will for example find out that it's post nasal drip and his laryngopharyngeal reflux so so patients do not fully understand for example the definition of the word blockage blockage means that you can't breathe and then when you have a look inside of the nose you can really confirm uh, your feelings. So the allergic rhinitis has got very typical findings. Uh, allergic rhinitis has got this edematous, pale, boggy mucosa with a lot of watery discharge inside, difficult to miss in acute phase. And the non-allergic rhinitis on the other hand can be almost anything. It can be in case of vasomotor, normal nose with a watery discharge. In case of uh, uh, idiopathic, you will see angry uh, looking lining, uh, which is inflamed, right? Um, there can be a bit of mucopus, which is like a sticky mucus. So looking inside of the nose is absolutely crucial. I scope every patient in the clinic. Now, if you have a look at the, so we looked at the phenotypes, and so now we're gonna look at the endotypes. Uh, so we have got these categories. I'm not gonna go into the depth um, because we want to talk more about the treatment. This is very important classification of the allergic rhinitis because the area classification, please have a look at the paper, there is already actually a new update, is classifying the, the symptoms also by duration and severity, and also how it affects the quality of life, which means mild, uh, moderate, or severe. So there is already some attempt to phenotype allergic rhinitis, and that's important because we do not, it's not black and white. There is always uh, some overlap and uh, disease is not always the same. So you can have a mild persistent or mild intermittent and so on. Um, 
And so this is very novel and important approach. Um, the world is not black and white and also rhinitis is not black and white. So we don't have allergic or non-allergic. You have got overlapping uh, phenotypes and they can develop even into one another and different endotypes may share same phenotype. So for example, you can have a uh, irritation laryngitis and also idiopathic at the same time. So for example, if you have a patient, you can easily have a patient with the allergic rhinitis then it, who is a swimmer, for example, so there is chlorine irritation, and he will have also the um, chemical irritation of rhinitis, and on top of it, he will have a septal deviation. So in such a patient, you can't just do the skin prick test, give him antihistamines, uh, nasal spray, and just send him home, because this patient will not improve. And in London, this patient will probably also do cocaine on top of it. So it's, it's quite complex, and it's really important to investigate every part of the problem, all factors. It, this is a beautiful table again from the same paper. Um, treatment and pathophysiology of each uh, phenotype. So we have got a non-allergic senile uh, rhinitis, uh, which is caused by mucosal uh, glandular atrophy. In those patients, uh, we go for ipratropium bromide. Important is that this is dose-dependent treatment, which means that uh, they have to often use it more than uh, three times a day, because in some patients it will dry up the nose only for a for an hour, um, and so you might have to use it more often. Uh, now, the gustatory rhinitis, that's, that's uh, really linked to the food uh, or drink, so you, the avoidance is the most important. Capsaicin uh, has been also tested. Now, the non-allergic uh, occupational rhinitis, that's a neurogenic inflammation. Obviously, the avoidance is the most important. Uh, hormonally induced, um, in such a case, we uh, go for the corticosteroids, potentially chromons. Um, and then the drug-induced avoidance, drug-induced means uh, xylometazole, notrivine, uh, nasal drops, and then lastly, idiopathic rhinitis, which is pretty much unknown mechanism or combination of a neurogenic inflammation and unknown, and in those patients, we treat them with the nasal corticosteroids, potentially capsaicin, which has been also tested. Treatment of allergic rhinitis. So first of all, the patient with, with a rhinitis who responds well to corticosteroids uh, and antihistamines really tend to be uh, more of an allergic type. If the patient doesn't respond to, uh, to the uh, corticosteroid nasal sprays, uh, then, then usually we have to look for other causes, uh, non-allergic or maybe some other, uh, other factors. So in terms of treatment of allergic rhinitis, uh, we can see that this is uh, consensus in the latest ARIA document. So in the a, in a first instance, we try to go for oral corticosteroids and, uh, sorry, we, we go for uh, antihistamines and potentially for less than 10 days of nasal decongestion. I actually go for uh, intranasal steroids um, directly. And then, of course, allergen and irritant avoidance. If the patient doesn't find this sufficient, so those patients have really maybe few weeks uh, in a year problem, then we uh, prescribe them intranasal steroids, potentially low chromon, but they should be also mainly on, a, on antihistamines. Uh, if this is not enough, then we start to consider immunotherapy. And this becomes a very important part of the treatment. And I'm gonna talk about that into the detail later. Um, now, what is important is that patients with allergic rhinitis in general are not under control. So the patients who are on the treatment and they are taking the treatment on a regular basis, or kind of, they still present with symptoms. It's better, but it's not under control. So when we look at this, it really seems that it's very important to, uh, there is a need for more effective therapy. And so what are the new treatment options? So we've got the new treatments and the known treatments. In terms of the known treatments, uh, we can try combinations. Um, like for example, the mistonasal spray. I'm not gonna talk about this because this is fairly, uh, fairly, fairly standard uh, of care, a combination of intranasal corticosteroids and antihistamine azelastine, or improvements of known treatments, like for example, more sensitive corticosteroids, or 
in terms of new treatments, uh, we're trying to target either single mediator or receptor. I'm going to talk about it later. And then drugs with more widespread effect, like uh, in this case, it's going to be the immunotherapy. So this is the allergic rhinitis immunologic response cascade, which allergic rhinitis is quite well described, so we know what uh, to tackle in this case. So in the beginning, uh, we have got the allergen is processed by antigen-presenting cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, and then afterwards, once it's processed, it's presented to the uh, undifferentiated T helper lymphocytes, which then is going to give a signal, will say hello to the, uh, to the other lymphocytes, and there will be overexpression of the TH type 2. So it's a TH2 type of response. TH1 is more of a, a neutrophilic inflammation. And so afterwards, the TH2 um, will, uh, will induce the production of the uh, allergen-specific Ig antibodies, and then comes the acute phase, uh, which is then defined as activation of a mast cells passed by bridging of two adjacent IgE antibodies, which are attached to the surface. And so this connection of the IgE and mast cell will then uh, result in a, in a release of, of histamines, cytokines, leukotrienes, and all these chemical mediators will then, and those will then cause uh, swelling, uh, vasodilatation, um, increased vascular permeability, mucus secretion, uh, and essentially in a plain language, this will be the reason for itching, uh, sneezing, uh, rhinorrhea, and nasal congestion. And now, when you have a look at this so nicely, we can see which parts of this cascade we can, we can affect. So we can, we can affect the, the beginning with a, with a immunotherapy or avoidance, uh, which is kind of a treating of the root of the problem. Then we can affect, uh, target the interleukins with the cytokine inhibitors, also corticosteroids. Then we can uh, focus on the overexpression of TH2 by TLR receptor agonists who can uh, actually suppress uh, this to happen or prostaglandin D2 receptor agonists. And then, this, and then production of the IgE can be, uh, can be also affected by the anti-IgE uh, therapy. And when you come to the acute phase, the immunotherapy has got a role, and then of course, mast cell stabilizers. So mast cell stabilizers are treatments which will prevent uh, release of antihistamine, uh, sorry, the histamine and cytokines, leukotrienes, and so on. Uh, and then of course, lastly, uh, we, can, we can just treat the inflammation itself using intranasal corticosteroids in the nose, and uh, and of course the antihistamines, which are local in this case. So now I'm going to start with the allergic uh, allergen immunotherapy, which is really important treatment, uh, quite game changing. So we have got the two types: we have got the subcutaneous, and we have got the sublingual. Now uh, the subcutaneous, that means that we will give an injection to a patient of so 20 micrograms, and this is about 2,000 times more than than a normal dose, what patient is having uh, when you inhale uh, the allergens. And the patient would have to have these injections once monthly uh, for about three years. And then the sublingual is a daily treatment. So the patient would have to place the tablet under the tongue and uh, leave it there for two minutes uh, to dissolve it. So what it does, it induces really the long-term tolerance and it changes the natural call, uh, history of the disease. So it really treats the root of a problem. And that's, I think, where we, what we want to get in the first place. Now, in terms of evidence, um, this amazing paper, uh, Meta-Analysis and Systematic Review by Dami, which was published in Allergy uh, Journal just recently, um, put together a huge number of uh, patients which were included in various uh, RCTs, so we're talking about 3,000 patients in each group uh, uh, together, and compared the subcutaneous and sublingual treatment to placebo groups. And so the primary outcomes were effectiveness short-term, which means during the treatment, and then long-term, at least one year after the discontinuation of the treatment. 
And so they were assessed were the symptom scores and the medication scores. Now the symptom scores is obvious, uh, but medication scores that means need to have a medication. So there is zero, one, uh, one two, three, uh, and it depends if you need uh, just a local treatment or antihistamines or corticosteroids. And so this will give you the scores. Less is of course better. And now, uh, just we can have a look at the numbers. It's quite important. So the combined effect against the placebo group. Again, you can see those huge numbers. So there is this standardized mean difference uh, of minus uh, 53. Minus means that it was effective and it was a moderate effect in favor of immunotherapy. So in other words, it works. When we have a look at the uh, subcutaneous one, it seems to be slightly better than the sublingual, but there is not a dramatical uh, difference. Uh, now, when we have a look at the medication scores, which means that how much patients needed medication after using, uh, after, after the immunotherapy or during the immunotherapy, then again, we can see that in a, in a, in a combined group, uh, there is a small to medium effect in favor of immunotherapy, and in the subcutaneous group versus placebo, there is a significant effect as well in the sublingual. So, and also the main question is, is this gonna last only after the finishing of the treatment? Unfortunately, the question is not that clearly. Uh, there were only four trials included for both which were judged as, a, as quite uh, low in possible, but in summary, all uh, studies showed beneficial effect in terms of uh, long-term effectiveness. So there is a hope, but we need better. Uh, I was talking now about the symptom scores, and in terms of uh, and for medication scores, it is the same story. So immunotherapy seems to work very well, at least for the in the short term, but mostly also in the long run. The problem with the sublingual treatments in terms of uh, subcutaneous, when you have a sublingual, it's difficult to say how much it's gonna absorb. That's the main problem. When you have the subcutaneous, there is uh, quite clear how much dose you got. But with the sublingual, uh, can be slightly tricky, and this seems to be the major issue, but of course it's uh, more common. Um, and now I'm gonna talk about the uh, other treatments. So now I'm gonna carry on with the omalizumab treatment, which is the anti-IgE uh, therapy. Now, uh, omalizumab prevents the Ig interaction with IgE receptors on the mast cell and basophil, so it's going to block it, and then afterwards the IgEs will not be able to uh, bind to the receptor and not cause uh, subsequent problems. And there are a few studies on that. Uh, now, this study which is actually quite old one, showed that when you uh, add the omalizumab on immunotherapy, there is a significant uh, difference in, a, in a both groups, uh, which means, uh, yeah. Uh, now, the, there are not many other randomized clinical trials. And the reason for that is that it's quite, uh, quite, quite expensive. Um, and it's really meant to be treated with rhinitis, but hopefully in the we will get that. But which means clinically, if you have a patient who have a have a IgE treatment, then check if there is a, uh, in your country potential availability, or uh, if the patient fulfills the indication for the uh, biological treatment. Then we can have a look at the uh, cytokine uh, inhibitors. So cytokine inhibitors will be targeted against the IL-4 and IL-13, which are the main mediators in, some, uh, in, a, in a THT response. So the first treatment uh, or the first drug is the suplatast, which is a cell inhibitor of synthesis of IL-4. Now, as I mentioned before, of the eosinophilic inflammation, and there was one study which uh, already showed on a human subjects that there was a significant decrease in nasal symptom scores and also um, 
uh, in, a, in a production and level of these cytokines. There is way more extensive research going on around the asthma. So along with the asthma, we are treating this poor cousin uh, rhinitis. Um, in the chronic rhinosinusitis, there is way more uh, in terms of treatment government. So uh, there are tests running on the mepolizumab and dupilumab, so IL-5 and IL-4 uh, inhibitors. Um, most likely this would probably have an effect also on, a, on an allergic rhinitis, but, uh, but still we're waiting uh, for that. Um, then there is a uh, optimism around the TL, TLR, uh, so toll-like receptors agonists and protein B2 receptor agonists. Just a quick uh, explanation. The, oh, the picture is not cut. Never mind. So the uh, toll receptor agonists are widely expressed on the immune. Now what happens is that the toll like receptor agonists will be able to target or uh, will, will be able to, to uh, tell your immune system that this is a needs to be removed from the system. Uh, so it will, it will mark it. And this is the way how it works. And the, a human test on a TLR7 uh, agonist. Uh, and this showed that there is uh, an allergic rhinitis patient with, with placebo. That they didn't actually have it as a treatment, they were just performing nasal provocation tests in the patients who, uh, who had a treatment or didn't have a treatment, which was uh, randomized clinical, tool, but we, we do not have uh, the, the human study on that. But we do have a human study on a, uh, on a TLR8, and this, was a, this, this shows statistic, statistically significant improvements in nasal symptoms. Now the prostaglandin receptors, uh, again this is a key mediator inflammation after allergen exposure. Um, it's true the problem already happened. So when you're exposed to the allergen uh, um, and it's able to suppress um, to, to this, uh, suppress this TH2 response. And again, we have got these two uh, uh, novel treatments, so PGD2 uh, receptor agonists, uh, now this is only the clinical trial name, uh, and both showed uh, that there is a significant uh, reduction in symptoms uh, so for, the other, uh, for, for the other drug. Um, now, these were the treatments for allergic type of uh, response. And now I'm going to talk about very briefly about the non-allergic type of rhinitis experimental uh, novel treatments. Fairly is a botulotoxin type injection or, uh, or insertion of soaked neuropathies into the nose. So the whole idea is that the botulotoxin, which inhibits the, re the release of acetylcholine uh, in synapses, will block the ACH and that will, re, uh, that will lead to reduction of a pathologic muscle movement and especially the gland patients, there will be less of a secretion. And so two trials are there and both uh, show that there was a reduction in a, in a uh, rhinorrhea and other symptoms. The effects of the treatment last second trial for two to three months, so it's actually not that bad and, with, uh, and, and the investigators didn't see any uh, side effects. Now the capsaicin, there was a lot of talk about the capsaicin uh, in the past. Um, so the capsaicin, of course, is the part of its agent, which is in a, within the hot pepper and is known for uh, desensitization or degeneration effect on the peptidergic sensory C fibers. And this is believed to be the main crucial part of the, uh, of the, of the uh, non-allergic pathway of the idiopathic rhinitis. And so there's already one Cochrane study on this, uh, Cochrane review of the study being done, and this showed the, that there is effectiveness of capsaicin for included studies, which are RCTs, and showed improvement uh, of nasal uh, symptoms. And there is already a drug in development, which hopefully in the, will uh, give us a, a 
uh, new treatment and new hope uh, to improve the symptoms. In terms of the more controversial or uh, not standard treatments, acupuncture it uh, works, but it's been believed that it suppresses the hypothalamus pituitary arterial axis, and this way it will affect the sympathetic and parasympathetic autonomic pathways. Now, there are actually surprisingly quite a lot of studies on this topic, and so the systematic review has been done, and you can see that it's included a lot of patients, uh, 2,300, and in uh, allergic rhinitis, it showed significant improvement in general of nasal symptoms. There is also one more trial which showed uh, similar results. So acupuncture seems to be effective and is actually recommended for allergies. There is no trial on allergic rhinitis. And now the rhino phototherapy, that's a big So the phototherapy has been demonstrated to have immunosuppressive effect. Uh, so that would be, of course, better for non-allergic rhinitis. Um, also, it is used now in chronic rhinosinusitis. This is now used for the various uh, inflammatory skin diseases, including atopic uh, dermatitis. There are two randomized clinical trials. So the first one uh, showed in allergic rhinitis patients a significant improvement, again, in the scores, but there was no uh, significant effect in a control group. So the bottom line is that in this study, it seems to have an effect. And in the second um, study, it was a, uh, it was, there was a RCT when the phototherapy was added on top of momentazone. And when we compared the group with added phototherapy and without, we saw uh, a difference. So again, this one seems to be effective for allergic rhinitis. Uh, but we need more studies which will have a look at the direct uh, comparisons. And so this is the last novel treatment, uh, kinetic oscillation stimulation. This is for non-allergic rhinitis. It, it is believed that so when you have a look at that balloon on the left side, you insert it into patient nose, then you inflate it and the system will create micro vibrations, like micro vibrations in your nose. And these micro vibrations will stimulate the autonomic pathways. And as a result, it will, this, uh, as a, it, will, it will then afterwards decrease in the long run nasal symptoms in the vasomotor rhinitis. And there has been a study on this in 2014, and it showed, um, and it, and it, and it showed that there were actually read symptom scores um, for patient symptoms when comp compared to placebo. Um, but there were no side effects really observed. Now, there is at the moment ongoing uh, study it's called Cordate. Uh, it's a multicentric study on this particular, uh, on this particular uh, device. And hopefully in the near future, this will show us some results. Uh, because it's also a randomized clinical uh, trial, whether uh, it is positive for patients or not. And now in conclusion, patients who are generally uh, well controlled uh, with a mild moderate, uh, just a standard treatment, but there is a tr group of patients who do not respond to, uh, to the standard treatments, and those patients are called squats or the severe uh, chronic upper airway disease, uh, which is difficult. And in those patients, we need some novel treatments. And so the local they are still the mainstay, uh, possible in a com combination with uh, antihistamines. The demista seems to, be, so the combination of a corticosteroid and azelastin, this seems to be a future, is really immunotherapy, which is able to the, or able to help uh, with the root of the problem and change the history uh, cause of the disease itself. Uh, and patient actually long-term benefit. Um, and lastly, uh, it's, it's a therapeutic challenge and we do have a new neurogenic, neurogenic 
pathway modulators, which, been te which are tested now at the moment. And hopefully in the future, uh, they will give us some uh, optimistic results. And lastly, I would like to add that it's very important that you will think in a bigger scale when you look at the patient, you will try diseases that the patient can have at the same time and not just focus on the first one that you identify, for example, sensitive to certain allergens, and then you, then you will be stop, uh, then you will stop looking for the other reasons. So it's important really to investigate uh, non-allergic or allergic aspects of So that was a very, very <clears throat> perfectly composed. Uh, thank you, Pavel, for uh, covering all the aspects uh, about uh, these uh, increasing uh, diseases uh, and, um, and uh, interests. Um, uh, I do have uh, one thing about uh, the last topic that you was uh, uh, talking about, the, the kinetic study about the, um, about the, the mucociliary movement and how we, uh, we can, uh, how to say, um, express those movements and increase the movement for the mucociliary uh, synonasal tract. Uh, um, I remember a study about 2013. Uh, I was doing yoga at that time, and uh, and I remember the the this uh, group of um, authors that were studying the nitric oxide um, values on people that were actually doing hummings. For those who don't know, hummings uh, is the is the movement and the exercise they do by breathing, and they were analyzing, in fact, this uh, this mucociliary movement and the amount and the value of the nitric oxide, and they in fact they 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 realize that the hummings would affect and uh, change the nitric oxide in such a way that would kind of prevent uh, and increase the value and, um, and, um, and the number of uh, nitric oxide in the synonasal cavities. Um, I just want to uh, report the one thing. I would like to congratulate to you and uh, another of our scientific members of the association who is uh, Dr. Pavel, uh, Peter Valentin Tomasic and uh, because uh, recently it just came out the new European position paper or a diagnostic tool of rhinology which I would like to suggest to all the, our colleagues uh, to go and check on rhinology journal is a free publication and you uh, and is available for everyone please go ahead and uh, and uh, download it because uh, there's another uh, lots of uh, suggestions and uh, uh, reviews uh, on uh, on uh, how the diagnostic tools could be uh, impact uh, the, um, the 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 clinicians. Um, we do have also, a... and also um, actually when you started this topic, there is one paper which I actually didn't include, and that is looking at. Uh, the effect of respecting guidelines. So there are really beautiful guidelines on rhinitis and uh, the clinicians who are respecting guidelines, the patients, they do better. So uh, please have a look at the Praxal study, at the ARIA document, at the ARC position papers. Those, there are pocket versions which are easily to understand and uh, readily to available, for example, on our mobile phone applications. And actually I use them. Yes. Uh, because it, you will never remember all those small details and that can actually help you on a day-to-day -day basis. Now there is an application to monitor the rhinitis uh, scores, and you can see uh, how the patient is getting on throughout his um, within a few months when you don't see the patient. And uh, this, this will also give you in, in extra information about the cause of disease. So, so, so really there, there are now new tools uh, which can help you. So the, the, you don't have to memorize everything. <laughs> exactly. Uh, by the way, there's also the, the ARIA uh, guideline is also available for, uh, for GPs and the pediatricians, so the P for, for those colleagues could uh, uh, download it and check. Uh, for the version is brilliant. Exactly. Uh, we do have many, plenty of questions. It looks like uh, these uh, topics is very uh, much uh, uh, interesting, and uh, I would. Uh, Due to our schedule, we do have uh, time for five, six uh, questions. Uh, one of our colleagues from Russia uh, is asking, uh, um, are, you, um, are you prescribing the immunotherapy or the, 
or has to be some kind of uh, um, collaboration between the specialist and the GP for, uh, for this kind of uh, prescription and or uh, should be the allergist that uh, the allergologist that should prescribe it? So it's actually a very good question. I think in most of countries, especially in the UK, uh, I do send a patient to the allergist because um, the patient might seemingly to me, for example, have a certain types of allergies which, and he would benefit uh, from, from immunotherapy. But actually when you have a look at the profile and correlate it with patient symptoms. So for example, a patient might have a house that's my allergy, uh, high sensitization, but actually symptoms are all in the summer. So it's probably not because of that but I would like to send a patient for the house that's mine, then it's really not um, most reasonable. So what I'm trying to say is that I do send a patient to the specialist, to the allergist, and they are responsible for prescription and then for administration. So the allergist in UK setting, and actually that's I think also in Netherlands and in many other countries in Europe. Perfect. Uh, another question from uh, France. Uh, our colleague is uh, asking, uh, um, are every patient that is, uh, um, um, that are you visiting at the clinics uh, uh, has to be addressed also to the allergologist or should the ENT um, make the consultation and uh, the prescription for an, uh, uh, an allergic rhinitis patient? So I, I think that first of all, the GP, the general practitioner should be able to uh, be able to follow the most basic guidelines, especially the pocket version of the area. So I think uh, that the basic recognition between non-allergic rhinitis and allergic rhinitis, that should be done on the most basic level. Uh, and then also starting the local corticosteroids and antihistamines. I think if this patient will not be uh, sufficiently uh, responding to the treatment, usually that in this case the patient comes to us. Very rarely the patient would have the uh, skin prick test or allergy test done, a blood allergy test, so that I will perform, um, I would offer to the patient and this is done by ENT. Uh, I might give a patient on top of it Montelukast or for example change Nasonex to uh, Demista, let's say, that's quite common. Um, and if the patient will not have a benefit out of this treatment, then I will send the patient to the allergist. Usually the reason for that would be the immunotherapy. And also if the patient will have, uh, very often the patients, they do have uh, wheezing titers on the chest. There is no, um, the asthma has not been recognized. So I tend to actually perform the lung function tests myself. And that would be another reason why the patient should have a better control. So bottom line, GP, then me, and then for immunotherapy, usually the allergist. Perfect. Um, uh, and about this, one of our colleagues from the Yaki is asking a question, when are you prescribing uh, um, the immunotherapy? Once uh, the nasal symptoms uh, cannot be controlled by just topical uh, therapy or you go for uh, um, antileucotrients uh, plus uh, antihistamines, so when it's failed, you go for, uh, um, for immunotherapy. So the local chains I tend to give a patient when, uh, when there is also asthma at the same time usually. Um, it's more about the discussion with the patient, really understanding uh, exactly the patient's troubles. So for example, the big boom is now with the house dust mite immunotherapy. Those patients really seem to struggle all year round and, uh, and, and, and for them this really seems to be uh, important. If the patient has got severe symptoms, but only a few weeks um, in, in the summertime, then we try to, we discuss, I discuss it with the patient. I explain the patient exactly what the immunotherapy would mean, how long the treatment would last, uh, how frequently the injections are given. And then we somehow, somehow together uh, try to find the solution and also the, uh, find, find, find out whether there is a reason to send it to allergists. So there is no clear uh, margin. For example, let's say guy who is in a finance has got polyvalent allergies, is mainly indoors, desk job, hates to go to nature, then uh, most likely this chap will not need immunotherapy. There is another patient with the same type of disease, 
who loves gardening, who loves to go out to, to the park with the, with the kids, with the grandchildren, and can't, can't do those things that he or she loves, or is a cyclist or runner, then in this patient, I would go for immunotherapy. So, so this, this, this would be my, my decision-making process. One of the problems that's, uh, uh, that's coming out is that uh, multiple allergic patients sometimes cannot be treated just by immunotherapy because of this multiple um, uh, exposure uh, to those antigens. Um, so are you think that uh, um, the immunotherapy alone would be enough for those patients or you would suggest for those three years uh, of, of treatment uh, that the patients should uh, um, follow like, uh, like, uh, like a line or, um, or um, or such, you know, in a, such a way that could uh, um, take control of the of the symptoms for a short period of time, or just in the period of the allergic exposition, or you would uh, um, predispose a, a topical treatment uh, every for like three months, or every time that the patient has uh, those uh, um, allergic symptoms. Because sometimes the patient are coming out and not just having those uh, allergy, um, uh, some allergy. Those, there are also some patients that are developing uh, non-allergic rhinitis uh, that are concomitant to those uh, with allergic one. What would you go and what would you suggest for those kind of patients? Yeah, actually, that's, that's a very, very good point because those patients are difficult to treat. And I think realizing that they have a two factors, two diseases at the same time, um, to phenotypes of these at the same time, then we really, um, then in those patients, diary is great thing. Mobile phone applications would be also great to really monitor the symptoms. But if the situation is that the symptoms are brainy, it's really better to use the uh, sprays long term. Because, and this is what I try to explain to the patient, that the corticosteroid sprays, they turn the unhealthy looking lining into healthy looking lining. So when I, it's, it's not just shrinking, like for example, oxymetazole, slometazole in the swelling and harming the mucosa at the same time, but this is actually turning the inflamed lining into non-inflamed. So it's actually making it look uh, healthier. And if they understand that for them, it's really much easier than to take it long-term because it's not the true addiction, uh, like in case of the congestions and also counseling them about the bioavailability. That's very important to understand how much really is absorbed that is really sub 10% and then what is the amount of corticosteroids in the spray? Because this is the major complaint. I don't want to take corticosteroids on a daily basis. And if I do have such a patient as you described, then I would probably uh, consider asking to use it uh, all the time. We, we have just enough uh, time for one question. And uh, we basically already treated the patients and, uh, and the symptoms uh, um, and all the features uh, in uh, two previous ground rounds uh, um, with the IACI president. So we are not going to talk about the asthma yeah. one, but uh, this question is very good. Is uh, um, what you prescribe, uh, what are you prescribing for those patients that has uh, uh, daily abuse of oxymetazoline and are also concomitant and suffering from allergic rhinitis? What are you, uh, suggesting to those patients, what are your algorithm for treating those patients? This is a very difficult group um, because there is already damage has been done. The lining is not just inflamed and swollen because of uh, allergic sensitization or exposure to allergens, but also because uh, harm that has been done by the decongestant spray on a, a long-term basis. Um, First of all, counsel them, really explain how, what is the mechanism of, uh, of action in decongestion spray versus corticosteroids. And of course, explain them the background of the disease. They have to understand, they have to understand this is a long-term problem. Then um, I, it, when they understand well, they would be able to stop the otrivin or whatever uh, other uh, type of decongestant. When they do not understand, it's quite unlikely. Now, uh, the, the major factor which, is, which makes them not to stop is, uh, is a sleep. So when they can't sleep, that seems to be the major issue. Uh, and those patients will uh, require some additional treatments. 
In a practical setting, I will give them corticosteroids for 10 days to a normal male, uh, 40 milligrams once a day, uh, and just stop. And in a females, usually 30 milligrams. At the same time, I will give them uh, dimista nasal spray if the patient is, um, is, is, is uh, has got allergic rhinitis and then sale allergies. Um, and again, counsel them, see them in a two months time. Most of patients are actually able to overcome that addiction and it seems to work, but 90% of, of the job is not actually the medication, but explaining. Um, if this fails, then those are actually patients that I tend to operate. So I think in such a group, the surgical treatment is, is, is more prevalent. Uh, because when you would perform a CT scan, often you would see these ostative changes within the inferior turbinate that would already suggest that there is a recalcitrant um, disease. And there, I think the surgery has got a role. In general, logic rhinitis doesn't, I, I think the, 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 the surgical treatment is slightly dubious, but in the, those are cases where it makes sense. Perfect. Uh, I think that uh, we 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 had enough time to talk about uh, uh, the whole fields and the novel treatment and therapies for the allergic rhinitis. Um, I just would like to congratulate you with your um, with your talk. Uh, I would like also to stress other two things. Um, we as uh, association Asasano uh, are glad uh, to have the ERS juniors and the ERS uh, um, part. And, um, and being a collaborative uh, for, the, um, for every meeting and uh, to encourage the young um, colleagues uh, to follow in uh, some, um, some, uh, some studies. Um, uh, regarding these, uh, I would like to express my gratitude for the ERS Juniors collaboration since 2015. This, uh, this collaboration started uh, between uh, when I was part of the ERS Junior Board and uh, thanks to Pavel and our colleagues, uh, we started to provide grants uh, every year. And uh, uh, this is uh, something that happens recently uh, in Belgrade and uh, is going to happen also in the future. Um, so please uh, follow uh, the ERS Junior page and the ERS uh, um, website for news, for um, uh, for new announcement about fellowships and the grants. Uh, and regarding this, I would like also to talk about the upcoming Bruxelles event and uh, ERS juniors and the ERS will be part of it. We, we will have a, a ground rounds also and uh, also would like to focus the attention on the 2020 meeting, which is going to be in Thessaloniki. It's going to be the next ERS meeting. Uh, the last thing, that I would like to, to, to tell the people is that uh, Dr. Pavel Suda um, named uh, one, uh, one um, uh, topical spray. I would like to, to tell our um, colleagues that uh, the name that he um, proposed, uh, it's uh, the only nasal spray that is in the market, actually, is not about the conflict of interest. It's, uh, it's uh, an association between uh, steroid and antihistamines, and this is the only one in the market, so there's no conflict of interest uh, at all. Um, I would like to thank you again, Pavel, for, uh, for your talk and the brilliant uh, uh, job that you've done for the new uh, European position paper on the rhinology tool. So please, once again, go ahead uh, to our colleagues uh, to download uh, this document. And uh, the next appointment is going to be uh, 15 of June with the president of uh, the Yaki Juniors, which is also um, a scientific member of uh, our association, Asasano, is a friend of us, Ivan Aguilos from, uh, um, from Spain. Um, and uh, after that, we will see each other again uh, in uh, for the second segment of, uh, of the Adherent 1st and 15th in September. Thank you again, Pavel, and uh, I'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye -bye.